All right, all right. So we're going to uh, call the meeting to order for the Swiss Leaders and Operations Committee meeting um, for today. Uh, we'll kind of just go around and do quick, brief introductions. Um, and then we'll get started. We have a short agenda today. Uh, we're going to have two items on the agenda, so we shouldn't have to be here till 530. All right, we'll start over there to my right in the corner. Hi, it's Terry Proctor, Communications Department. Hi, Liz Large, Contracted General Counsel. Keith the last there, Project Manager, Jefferson Modernization. Kareem Hassanane with Co-Locate Design, Community Engagement and Organizing on the Jeff Project. Kareem Crespo, Senior Director of the Office of School Modernization. Ayanna Horn, Project Manager, Jefferson Modernization. Uh, Will Mins, um, usually the DSC representative from Lincoln. High school. Awesome. Uh, Gary Hollins, uh, Chair of the Operation Board Member. Julia Ben Edwards, Board Member and Committee Member. Herman Green, um, Board Member and uh, yeah, Committee Member and Community Person and Advocate for the Community. <laughs> Roseanne Pell, Board Manager. Jonathan Garcia, Advocate and Chief of Staff. <laughs> Thank you for Yeah, some people over on the right. David Main, Communications Manager for the Bond Program. Uh, Hannah White, uh, Planning and Wills. Awesome, awesome. All right, so um, we have two um, agenda items. And so we will turn it over to Marina and get started. Thank you. Uh, we are giving a progress update presentation on the Jefferson High School modernization. Um, we've asked Kareem to join us as well today to really focus a little bit more on the community engagement side of things. Um, so we're going to go through a little bit uh, um, with our team here first. Kareem will kind of jump in and then we'll move forward some things after uh, he's done with this piece. I will start with the land acknowledgement and anti-oppression statement. At PPS, we strive to strengthen our relationships with the Native community and Native nations. A symbol of this commitment is a land acknowledgement. These statements bring visibility to the first peoples of our collective home. This statement is meant to provide information and context while also encouraging all of us to reflect on our current relationship with Native people and Native experiences. We acknowledge that we live, work, and play on the traditional land of the Chinook, Clackamas, Kalapuya, Multnomah, Wasco, Kaplimit, Tualatin, and Malala. We also know that many other tribes made their homes along the Columbia and Willamette Rivers. We honor their history and acknowledge the sacrifices they made. Let us also acknowledge the robust, present-day federally recognized tribes of this area, the Grand Ron, Siletz, and Cowlitz. In addition, I would like to acknowledge the Chinook Nation, who has been seeking federal recognition for many years. The urban Indian community is made up of tribal diversity that originates from around the country, representing 400 tribes. The urban Indian community has a vivid history made up of people whose journeys have brought them to Portland by ways of forced displacement or seeking more opportunities. Today, these tribes and communities celebrate their heritage, showing resilience and tenacity that would be greatly admired by their ancestors. Within Portland Public Schools today, we serve students and families representing more than 150 tribal nations within our education system. It is our obligation to teach accurate information, past and present, about the impact of colonization on our students, all students today, and make visible the multitude of Native families and many diverse ways Native communities and families are living in the present. We encourage every person to reflect on their own history understand the history of colonization and genocide, and support indigenous sovereignty, priorities, and actions. This acknowledgement is one step that we can take to improve our support of indigenous communities in the area. In addition to acknowledging the land and those that have been here since time began, we must also remember our stolen siblings from Africa, whose labor built the vast wealth of this country. These two communities and the atrocities committed against them are intrinsically intertwined due to our existence, existence within a white supremacist world. Everything we have is due to stolen land and stolen labor, and every system and institution that impacts our lives is built upon this legacy. It is our job to speak that truth and to 
spaces so that we can begin to heal. Thank you. One quick thing, I want to give acknowledgement. Um, Vice Principal Fred Jackson passed away. Oh, retired Vice Principal uh, passed away. Uh, he was a Vice Principal of Benson High School. Uh, so I just found out like 20 minutes ago. Um, and I want to be remiss not to mention something. He was a real big part of my time at Benson. Um, and you know, when we talked about like the disciplinary stuff, he was like the disciplinary stuff at Benson and um, he'll be missed. Just want to give like, a quick acknowledgement of that. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, having that moment at the end of the, um, the statements, like every time I finish reading that statement, I do take a moment to just like, yeah. be, it, it just caused for a moment to pause. Um, okay, leaning in then to the project timeline. Um, this provides a quick overview of the project schedule. Um, the planning for the project began back in 2019 when we first engaged with the community on the conceptual master plan. And with that, we used that process to help develop a scope, schedule, and budget for the Jefferson High School modernization project for the 2020 bond. And as you can see, we are currently still in the planning phase as we finish up the comprehensive plan. The plan provides the basic structure for design and we will go to the Board of Education for approval for that next month. That is the beginning of the design, which, we will, which will last for several months and ultimately lead to construction. Throughout all of it, we will be continuing to ask the community for input and feedback, and there, that cycle will continue, and providing progress updates along the way. Throughout the planning and design process to date, we have reached out to multiple stakeholders from all different types of groups. Those include stakeholders from the Jefferson High School community, community members such as alumni, incoming families, neighbors, and school partners. Regulatory agencies are shown over there in the gray, and they have a lot to say about what's built. And internal PPS stakeholders such as district leaders from across all departments, board members, CBSE leadership, and the Bond Accountability Committee. Here are some of the many events that we have done throughout the summer and earlier in the year that document the um, provided stakeholder input. Um, next, you'll hear from Kareem, who is from our engagement partner, Colocate, and Kareem will tell you more about what we've been hearing from the community. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I'm glad to be here to be able to talk through this. Uh, and I'll start by saying this is going to be the tip of the iceberg. We've got a lot more conversations ahead of us as design gets really underway in phase two. Um, and this is a point in time snapshot of where we are as of the assembly of this presentation. So we've, over the course of the last six months, had over 600 stakeholder conversations, whether that's in the form of one on one conversations or Table events or large group, large focus groups or gatherings um, where we're interacting with folks working in, in classes with students. And through that effort, well over 700 comments, those are the ones that we've tracked thus far, but we're still entering more into our spreadsheet and looking for the themes and narratives that emerge from all the conversations that we have. So as we are having conversations in community, we're listening for what are the narratives, what are the themes that emerge consistently and rise to the top um, in terms of priorities and concerns, in terms of opportunities and the ways that people are envisioning the future um, and how it could work for them in how the, the spaces at Jeff could work for them as well as the, the ways that activities happen within the spaces better, more equitably, more inclusively. Um, so we prioritize uh, as co-locate users or stakeholders, community members who are disproportionately impacted by a project and tend to have the least amount of influence over decision making processes in these types of architectural efforts. Um, many people don't understand how these processes work. It's really opaque. It's difficult to access for, for a lot of folks who don't have architectural training or backgrounds. And yet they are going to be impacted by these projects day in and day out for generations. So it's really critical that we're connecting with folks for whom the, the outcomes are going to have a substantial personal impact. Um, so 
having defined a little bit around a little bit about who our primary users and how we prioritize users, um, I'm going to dive in a little bit to the design justice considerations for the sort of big scenarios that we've been studying throughout this phase, which is really around whether it should be a full replacement or a modernization, renovation, expansion project. Um, and within our um, primary stakeholders groups, as we've defined them, uh, it's important to acknowledge and recognize that the Black community in Portland with multi-generational roots in the historic Albina region of this city um, has uh, a lot at stake in this school as both a uh, historically predominantly Black school as well as the context of gentrification and displacement that continue to this day and, and are ongoing. Um, and that this school, like so many schools, exists as both a space for learning as well as a cultural institution with deep um, meaning for folks over multiple generations, whether they are themselves personally alumni or not. So <clears throat> starting from that point, uh, many of these narratives that have emerged over the course of our conversations within community may not be a surprise to folks who have an understanding of the history of the uh, development of urban farming in Portland that um, people have interacted both with development and with the institutions, government agencies, and, and public processes that govern those systems. So around um, the topic of modernization and support for uh, saving a historic element of the existing Jeff spaces and expanding, the primary narratives that have emerged are around spatial justice, uh, displacement and gentrification, and cultural pride in place. Um, we have heard uh, about cultural significance within the context of displacement at JEP. Um, we've also heard and observed the continued demolition of historically black spaces in this city and the ways that that is traumatizing now for communities today, for students and their families today, as well as um, existing within a legacy of trauma that has as yet been unaddressed by this city in any meaningful reparative way. Um, there are efforts underway in many different avenues towards that, but uh, the healing has not yet. Um, there's also been belief that full replacement is predetermined from a lot of folks that we've talked to, and that plays into those fears of um, Jeff is going to be taken away from the community, that uh, they're going to build a new school for the neighborhood as it exists now with the changing demographics and essentially building a school for gentrification. Um, I, I, I'll get into some of the more detail of the themes and narratives as we move through the slideshow, but trust has been a huge one. Trust or lack thereof with this institution, with Portland Public Schools and the legacy of harm that many black and brown families have experienced from this institution over, again, generations, um, as well as how that interacts with or relates to um, people's experiences in other public processes where maybe they've been asked, what do you think? and then never really seen the results of that um, or been able to follow that thread of how that's being communicated back to them and their needs or their desires are being demonstrated in the outcomes. Um, it's also important to note the black community remains rooted in this place. And so in some of our conversations with uh, folks in the neighborhood, parents, alumni, other stakeholders, um, we have heard comments along the lines of, well, why does it matter to design for black and brown families they're, if they're not in this neighborhood right anymore. Um, shouldn't we be designing for the people who are here today? And I want to just state, I haven't heard that coming out of a place of where I would imagine direct malice or um, you know, personal um, bias so much as concern that if we're designing for uh, a modernization, then does that mean that the students who are coming into this school now will be losing out on something? Does that mean that the resources that would otherwise have gone into a new facility will no longer be available? So I'll get to that on the next slide a little bit, but um, it, it's necessary to, to recontextualize that the Black community remains rooted in this, in this place, in this part of the city, and at this school in the context of um, a neighborhood that's become virtually unrecognizable to many people over the last uh, so that connects to the, this sentiment or narrative that full replacement would do irreversible damage to the continuity of connection to place. 
and heritage uh, that many folks in the black community feel towards Jeff, uh, that there are very few places uh, still standing, structures still standing within the neighborhood in North and Northeast Portland that um, can visibly connect to those layers of history. And when folks say, my parents went here, my grandparents went here, my cousins went here, um, and the, the thought that some edifice of this structure will no longer be standing, um, that there's a lot of sense of loss or grief connected to that. And again, historic buildings anchor cultural connections. It's not so much about the architectural um, integrity of a building or the historic integrity of a structure so much as it is the fact that it has continuity and presence over multiple generations. And the experiences that folks have had in those spaces um, are, are critical to social and cultural cohesion and jubilance and joy and delight and all the things that we look for when we gather with others. So around considerations for um, supporting replacement, uh, renovation quality concerns have been the largest uh, piece that has emerged, um, as well as concerns around safety, and then uh, some concern or uh, sentiments around the legacy of the namesake of the school, Thomas Jefferson, um, being a white supremacist to uh, enslaved human beings. Um, and so for some people, that topic alone is enough to say we need to be around and we need to start over. That's the only way to get a, a clean break with that um, legacy. However, that is a much smaller subset of the folks that we've been engaged with. That has not been the predominant narrative. For the most part, it really has been. Um, if you've seen the existing conditions of the building, uh, it's hard not to question how that those buildings still standing could be made safe if you don't understand or haven't experienced what a full renovation or remodel of a historic structure looks like. So knowing that there's signs up on the water fixtures that say don't drink the water, knowing that there has been extensive asbestos remediation in the building over the last few years, um, knowing that there are tiles that fall off the ceiling and holes in the walls, um, you know, those experiences um, from students, from alumni, from community members drive a lot of the concern. Is it possible to do a good job and create a safe, healthy uh, environment for students, teachers, faculty, and community members um, through a renovation? Um, and I think that also that really speaks to the work that we have collectively ahead of us to communicate what clearly what it means to go about uh, undertaking a project of this sort of um, so we're actively out there having those conversations, gathering these concerns and questions so that we're able to respond to them more effectively, but it's important to know where there are gaps and where there are communication breakdowns on what we as experts or uh, folks who've worked in this space for, for a while understand and what folks who are coming into it fresh may, may not. So across the board for any scenario, there is alignment, which is, shouldn't be a surprise, um, as ultimately whether the historic structures are saved, renovated, and expanded upon or fully replaced, people want the spaces to function in a particular way. They want to see Jeff as a cultural student and community hub, a place where people don't feel like they are being caged out or caged in. Um, they want to see state-of-the-art facilities and culturally relevant programs and pedagogy. We've actually been asking a specific question in our engagement around um, if you could envision a, a curriculum for social justice, what would that look like? And getting some really, really beautiful um, suggestions and ideas there um, that touch on everything from CTE to uh, specific programs around uh, transformative justice or race studies. Um, so there's a lot around that. Um, present and future health and safety concerns has come up a lot. So in addition to how will the future spaces be made safe, um, how will the current spaces be made safe, how will students stay safe and healthy in those environments throughout construction. Um, there's both enthusiasm, excitement, and interest in the prospect of being so close to a construction site uh, that you can actually learn from it as an experience. 
as well as a concern around how to keep students and other, other stakeholders safe during the construction process. Um, and if anything can be done to ameliorate the current conditions in any way while this is happening for those who are going to be in the building over the next uh, several years, that con con continues to raise the price. Um, beyond that, uh, things like covered outdoor gathering spaces for students and community, the exterior spaces around the, the school are not really designed or developed to their full capacity to be able to support the types of experiences folks are looking for. Um, there's a lot of interest in revitalizing historic programs that have existed at Jeff in the past, as well as increasing economic opportunity through other upcoming, um, other more contemporary programs. So within that, uh, the TV production um, curriculum that existed at Jeff gets cited often as uh, something beloved, both for the the uh, relationship that the teacher, Mr. Lenny Edwards, was able to build with, with students over many generations of students, but also the importance of being able to tell your own story and be able to uh, effectively use the tools of mass communication um, to advocate for oneself or one's community and communicate to one's own community rather than having narratives imposed upon um, one's community is really, it's really significant and important to, to many folks we've spoken to. Um, and then, this is maybe obvious if you have had to go through classes or navigate the building um, at Jeff currently, but less stairs, new elevators, a simpler layout, more daylight. Um, a lot of that is coming from the students directly. Um, and, you know, while I am always conscious to say we can't guarantee we'll put escalators or slides into the building, but, um, I think it, it does speak to the, the accessibility of the building currently, and that it, it needs to be addressed in the design. So that was a, a high level overview, and I'll, I'll leave it to y'all to check me on time. Um, but I want to cover what the main narrative themes are in a little bit more depth um, as, we, as we keep working towards this this beautiful new Jeff project. So um, as I noted, we take copious notes in every conversation that we have. And in those notes, uh, once we've transcribed them, we are looking for uh, talking points, words, phrases, things that clue us into themes that then kind of aggregate up into a broader narrative. We're listening for who is most impacted by a project, um, who's most vulnerable, within the communities associated with the project, what the prevalent uh, concerns might be within those communities. Um, and those m may be spatial and often are, but are not constrained to spatial concerns. So we are listening for implications around program and policy as well as space. Because if you have a conversation with them, ask them, what do you think about this space? They're gonna tell you about the, the experiences that they have accessing that space. They're gonna tell you about the challenges that they have um, getting resources through that space or navigating the process to be able to do a particular thing there. And, and those are more tied to policy governing how space is used or accessed as well as programs and, and what is actually supported within the architecture. Um, so we don't censor or try to separate those out or say, you know, don't talk about that, let's listen. We only want to hear about this. Um, but we're also listening for operational considerations, questions and concerns about the project, the process, our team. We get a lot of questions like, who are you and why do you care? <laughs> and we should be able to answer that. Uh, and then potential opportunities that um, the communities that are most impacted by this effort will, will have around how to address underlying conditions of the project. So that takes us to the, the narratives that you see on the side there. As I mentioned earlier, trust. Uh, identity, culture, and belonging, which tends to be one of the largest ones. Um, safety, access, flexibility, and change, resources, delight, and then embracing the outdoors. Uh, as we continue to move through this, new narratives may emerge. Um, the breakdown of the specific themes or subtopics within each of these narratives will probably uh, shift in terms of proportion, uh, but again, this is a snapshot of where we are right now. So I'll give an overview of these, and then if there's time, I can go through in a little more 
depth on each of the, the narratives themselves. Um, if there's not, I'm happy to, to answer questions. And that detail exists in the slideshow. And we are putting together, uh, right now it's around 60 pages, uh, but we're putting together our summary report, uh, which is an implications report that, again, covers all of these in depth with specific decision points and considerations on which, um, around spatial policy and programmatic relations. So trust, um, Trust really is about recognizing the ways that Black, Indigenous, and other communities of color have been impacted by sy systematic racism um, and injustice, and how that has manifested within district policies, procedures, and spaces over many generations. Um, and ultimately, this is really about why people don't want to engage in this process in the first place. Uh, when if they do, where the fear, anger, mistrust, and and um, concern is coming from, and there's a lot there. Um, under identity, culture, and belonging, uh, these, these conversation points and, and comments really are highlighting Jeff as a cultural institution. Sorry. Time up. Sorry. <laughs> we'll take calls in a moment. <laughs> um, so this is really about how uh, black and brown communities um, use this space and access this space as a cultural institution and resource, um, as well as the need to make it welcoming, resourceful. What does welcoming and belonging mean in a school, at this school? Um, how, do, how can the space empower communities of diverse racial, ethnic, and other affinity groups? Um, and also reflecting the strength that uh, communities find in their, in their interactions at Jeff. Um, security, safety, we make a bit of a distinction between those two. They often get used interchangeably. Um, safety is about more than just the physical security of the building. So security really is about uh, things like access and physical infrastructure and um, things come up around uh, perimeters, uh, keeping a secure perimeter, uh, making sure that folks who are entering the space are supposed to be there um, and that yeah, any transparency needs or th things to support visibility around security are in place. Um, safety is encompasses physical and emotional harm, but is much more about the interpersonal dynamics around that, um, as well as public health concerns such as COVID. Um, so we're continuing to hear on this topic a lot of uh, need for things like support for mental health for students. Um, staff as well, um, and things like restorative justice, transformative justice processes that uh, lead to a more safe environment overall, rather than um, solely em uh, emphasizing or focusing on how a space is policed or surveilled, uh, which tends to be the sort of main, main yeah. uh, tactic for addressing security in many, many architectural instances. Okay, uh, so you got, you got about 10 more minutes. Okay, I'll sum it up. Access, uh, accessibility, this is um, probably something familiar to many folks in this room, but it's a, it is both about um, accessibility for disabled students, uh, faculty, um, as well as uh, inclusive and universal access for neurodiversity, gender uh, diversity, economic diversity, uh, how do people access these spaces physically and financially if, if that is a barrier. Uh, flexibility and change. This needs to be a dynamic building and school that uh, works over the next hundred years uh, for however our city and our students' needs evolve. Um, and so some of this is designing for things that are as of yet unknown, but it helps us understand what, what future orientations folks are thinking about. And resources is around not only educational and sociocultural resources, but uh, also having to do with um, broader systemic issues that affect students' lives and that can be addressed through their experiences at school, such as food, housing, uh, rest, la lack of ability to get enough sleep, um, transportation, all of these things are resources that have an impact on students' ability to succeed and thrive in their communities as well. Delight, 
hopefully speaks for itself. It's what's delightful, it's what's inspiring, it's what's joyful, it's the things that make people feel like they are entering a space of celebration and resilience and uh, creativity. And then embracing the outdoors is really around just what it says, how to use outdoor spaces, connect them to indoor spaces, bring that biophilia into the building, um, and uh, make take advantage of uh, the beauty of Oregon and of Portland uh, around this campus. Again, so it's not just big fields uh, that aren't necessarily very hospitable or, or functional in, in flexible ways. These overlap, these intersect. Uh, so in our report, you'll see references where we'll call out, like, this is a topic under trust, but let's look for more information under resources. Um, and I don't think I'll have time to go through each of these, but. Yeah, I, I would like to see the, uh, yeah, well, see like what kind of the options were. It looked like you guys narrowed down some options. So I would like to get into that a little bit. Yeah, just to build on that is like, so taking that great summary you just produced, um, I think it's a lot of uh, rich uh, feedback from the community, then how is, how is that impacting or informing? It's funny you should ask, I think that's actually one of our next slides to talk a little bit about the process. Uh, so really what we tried to do is put together um, a little bit of a diagram of how all of the different inputs lead into the planning and design process. And I think there are a couple things that we want to take away from this, which is, first of all, there are lots of different inputs that we're getting, and certainly there's a, um, many different ways that we're reaching out to the community to get community engagement. We have other stakeholders as well. And so that engagement is occurring at the same time with our staff, um, with folks in the district. Um, we're getting things, inputs from our ed specs, for example, and from design guidelines that inform um, materials, for example, right, or systems. All of those things are going to feed into both the planning and the design. And so we get this question of, well, how does my particular input get reflected in your comprehensive plan? It may not be reflected in the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan is really just the first step to the design. And some of the input that we get is going to be very general input, and it helps us narrow things down for the comprehensive plan, which, you know, things like um, the general site layout, uh, where we're going to put the front entry. How big should the buildings be? How, what's the mass of them? Um, where are different programs generally going to go so that they're you know, close to each other? Or how are we going to face the construction? These are the kinds of questions that we're trying to answer as part of the comprehensive plan. It's the, the structure or the framework that the design then builds on. So a lot of the input that we get now may go to the comprehensive plan, or it may actually just continue going towards the design, which is a process of narrowing down options and getting more and more detail into how the building is actually going to be constructed, how it's going to look at it. So, you know, we, we wanted to kind of call this out because many people seem to think that this comprehensive plan is, you know, that's it. it we're, you're not going to ask us any more questions after that. And, oh, by the way, I don't see how this thing I said about X is in your comprehensive plan. It's not the end. It's really just the beginning. It is the starting point. We will continue to take input. We will continue to use that input as we refine the design. And we're certainly keeping track of you know, all of the things that we're getting, the 60 pages uh, that Kareem was talking about. It's a starting point. Right? There's so much more ahead of us in terms of how how much um, feedback we're going to be getting. And so that, what you just explained there, is that getting communicated out to the, to the community as well? Like, hey, you guys, this is just a starting point. We've been trying okay. to communicate that. We're going to keep communicating. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Some, it, sometimes it's hard to, it's hard for, to, yeah. to gather, but you know, as long as we just continuously 
letting them know that, that you know, hey, this is a starting point. This is not over. We still got a whole lot. Yeah, of nothing is that over. repetitive stuff is going to always be. So I we appreciate that. And I think it's the collective. I mean, and I'm learning, what I'm learning from my end is like the collective responsibility. Like it's not just on this team. It's like so when I get asked about Jefferson, it's like yeah, and it's you know master plan in December, and then it continue the engagement continues. Here's how you can get engaged, right. right? So I think all of us having that universal talking point will be important. So um, just build, building on that, what is coming to the board in December? Like it would be useful to know. Like here are the here are the major components that are coming to the the board in December. The comprehensive plan will come to the board in December. What we used to call the master plan. Yeah. So I guess like yes. what. Like even more like the click down like what like the major i don't need to know now but like what are the major components like this is this phase and then when people say but you know what about x and it's like oh well that's coming later so as part of this everybody educating people at what point in time things are coming so being able to understand so basically what you're going to see similar to the master plans in the past you're going to see um site general site plans you're going to see some very basic bullet plans Think of them as bubble diagrams, but with squares, right? They won't be circles. They'll be a little more uh, squared off. General layout of the buildings. You're going to get um, information regarding um, how it matches up against our end specs. So if there are any significant deviations from end specs, you're going to see that as well. We will use the same information layout that we've used for master plans in the past so that board members who have been on the board yeah, for previous plan, so, you know, so. we, we actually intended to give you some information okay. ahead of time so you know what you're looking at okay. um, and you know how to value the information that you're getting and then you're going to get an awful lot of um uh we'll call them appendices right but that sort of um, implies that they're not as important it's actually just all of the supporting documentation that is led into this so it will include things like the board spec but it'll also include all of the meeting minutes from the um, community engagement. We've done our CPC meetings. It'll include their report as well. Um, just trying to think, what else am I missing? So one of the big questions from the community that's on the community trust is like, is it gonna be like maintain part of the facade? That that will be answer, that will be answered in the master plan or yes. it will be answered? Okay. Yes. Okay, that so. will be answered in the master plan. And we're going to show you two um, two options yeah. tonight. Um, so that's where we're going to head towards. Um, we, we, we do want to we want to show our cards a little bit, which is to say, if you haven't heard it already, we're definitely getting some clear preferences. So yeah. we're going to we're going to give you a little bit of that, yeah. too. But we do want to show you both of the options that everybody has looked at. Awesome, um, awesome. When we come that's back on day. the 30th, we will have one. one. OK, OK. I have a question around um when you start looking at the all the different methodologies you guys are using to reach out to connect with um, different individuals is there a breakdown on the the demographic so instead of saying the percentage you know x number of percent of people um were there or 30 to percent of the people did this well that could be three people and so do we get a breakdown that shows the demographics of the people that have been making the decisions around what jeff is going to look like having sat through the, the Roosevelt redesign, um, it had a, a very black focus in conversation, um, but the decisions was made by a lot of older white community members. And so I want to be very clear in that for me, I don't want to hear a bunch of white women or white men or white people in general telling me what's best for a black community. So I want to know that in our in our dialogue, in our in our reaching out, that we're able to look at the demographics. And if our target audience is this, then how is that target audience represented and at what to what extent? And if we're not getting the results um, that we we feel like we need to like to move forward because they're they're not showing up, then I want to look at how are we how are we in being intentional about reaching out to those families and what are some of the different avenues that we might need to we might need to take to get them to the table because to me to me to simply say we tried and they didn't show up so we're moving on is not enough 
I know you want to answer this, and I think that's all right. I'd love for you to do that. But just real quick before we get into that, I want to clarify the people making decisions. Because it's a very interesting, like we hear this over and over again. Who are the people making the decisions? Is the CPC making the decisions? Part of showing you that previous slide was to say decisions are very complex. And sometimes the decisions are not made by people so much as they are made by circumstances, which is to say, um, if the code requires X, the decision is X, right? So different things can influence um, what the ultimate shape of an object is, but it's not like there's one set of people making decisions. What we're trying to do is go out and gather as much input as possible. And so that's where I think, I just want to preface. Well, I didn't let, didn't let me I'd be like Kareem, No, I'd like Kareem to actually talk about the process, because I think he can answer more of what you're looking because for. Because there's some, when, yeah. from a legal, a code, I understand code. Right. And I understand that they can say, we want you to build it seven stories high. Well, legally, I can't do that. So I don't care what you want. That decision has been made. So I'm not talking about that. I'm presuming all things being equal, given that the, the legalities of what we can do are being done and the things that we can't do are not being done and with all that being equal when it comes down to saying we want to hear from the community and we're going to use that community input to to make to help us guide what's in the building and what what the spaces look like that we're actually getting input and guidance from the individuals that we say that we want it from exactly and that's the part where i'm hoping Kareem can kind of step in and talk a little bit more about the process. Happy to do so. Um, so, our engagement strategy, our approach is built on community organizing strategy at Colocate. So, we are not a um, traditional engagement practice. We're actually an architecture practice that uses organizing and advocacy as part of our tools for a more just environment and society. Um, and what that means is that on every project that we work on, um, every project we're able to make it happen, we have a program where we actually we are hiring onto our team folks from the communities that are most directly impacted and that are in relationship within their communities, have networks of folks that they can reach out to, that they can amplify uh, what's going on. They can also, because they're already in we are, because they already have that lived experience and expertise and understanding of the issues impacting their communities, they bring that into the project and into, into our team's understanding of the context we're operating within in an immediate and much more direct manner than a typical outreach process would hold, where you're just holding open houses and hoping that people will show up, for example, or just holding uh, public meetings and hoping that people will attend. So on this project, we've got seven folks as our community design organizing team, um, all of whom have deep relationships within the community uh, around Jeff. We're, again, as I mentioned, specifically focused on black and brown families and communities. Um, and all of these folks bring multiple identities, right? So people are complex, but they've got representation across generations from um, immediate gra past graduates of Jeff 2020, class of 2021, um, through folks who have decades of experience working at, at the school or with UCC, um, you know, in the neighborhood, folks who live in the neighborhood, folks who have been displaced from the neighborhood, um, folks who are early child educators. This is a part of our strategy and part of our approach that is fundamental to the to um, being able to address the, the considerations that you're raising, which is how do you make sure that the community that's most impacted is actually influencing decisions and outcomes. I'm not going to put all of the responsibility or weight on, on them by any means, and I'm not also going to, as, as you referenced earlier, um, say that it's within our ability to totally change the uh, entire system and existing processes of uh, well-established institution like PPS. Um, what I will say is that our primary focus and engagement, and we can share the 
we ask people to share their demographic information voluntarily. We don't force people to uh, do that. Not everyone's comfortable doing so. Um, but where we have that, we keep track of it. Um, so we can share how what we've heard and who we've talked to lines up with various stakeholder communities of color and culture. Um, and our focus, first and foremost, has been on Black students, Black families with historic connections to Albina, North Portland, Northeast Portland, whether they are still in the neighborhood or not. It's not relegated to geographic location because we understand that there are broader systems impacting that. It's also um, important for me to note that we, we've been working on connecting more with the Latina communities that exist at Jeff and had some sessions with some stakeholders. We've got some student class, student workshops coming up with Latino network students. Um, but we haven't had interpretation uh, resources available at any of the public town hall meetings or CPC meetings to be able to make it accessible to folks for whom English is not their first language. Um, that's a barrier to access. That means we're not able to reach people. Even if we have flyers that are translated in, those lang in all the languages spoken, um, we can't actually invite people into that space if they don't have support there. Um, we've been working towards addressing that. Um, that's, again, not something that we can unilaterally address ourselves, but it is something that the community has asked for more support on and would like to be able to offer it. I can say at the open house that's coming up next week, we'll have Spanish interpreters, so that's a step in the right direction for sure. Um, but it's also not entirely clear what avenues uh, folks need to go through to request those types of support or accommodations. Um, and I'll confess it's not entirely clear, clear to me either. Um, so having said those things, the question of who's making decisions is not my decision, right? Not our team, the design team's decisions. And that question comes up constantly. Well, actually, it's, I, I think you answered it. Um, in that what I'm looking for is, are we tracking the demographics? Because we need to be able to go back to the community yes. and be able to um, be able to spell out as clear as mud that we had, you know, we've had X number of meetings and in those meetings, they have been represented by X number of people and X number of our community has been there or has not been there. And so we need more of us to come out if we want to have a voice. This is not to put all the onus on one on any one organization or any one individual, but it's also to hold me accountable as well to say, okay, am I doing my part to make sure that I'm spreading the word that if we wanna hear from the black community that we need you to show up and then to hold everyone else accountable to say, stop saying that we wanna hear from the black community and, and don't be intentional about making sure that they can show up. So this is about, to me, an effort of accountability to say, this is what we've done, this is what it's looked like, and here's where it's written. So I, I, I think you did answer it. I don't think as far as like making the decision, um, I, I can recall, you know, everybody putting stuff on the board, write your dream and put it on the board, and then write this dream and put it on that board and tell me where it lands and then come back. And then several of the things that I didn't want, I wanted, didn't make it in, <laughs> but several of the things that other people did. So I, I get that, um, it's a, it's a big process, it's a big undertaking, but um, it's the tracking and the demographic, being <coughs> target demographic, and to be able to showcase that, that I want to make sure that we stay on top of. I want to note too that I think the difference between Roosevelt and Jefferson in our community engagement is, is substantial. It really is. And I, you know, I think it, I want to acknowledge that often when we pull together um, our planning committees, design advisory groups, um, we do get a lot of white people. And so acknowledging that that particular venue may skew white, we have also brought in a lot of other venues, right? It's, it is not just about the planning committee, it's also about the work that Colette has been doing, reaching out and having one-on-one -on -one conversations in meeting with um, specific focus groups. And I think one of the things that Kareem mentioned last week at the town hall was um, meeting with all the different alumni classes as separate focus groups to talk through what their specific 
you know, concerns, interests, desires were. Um, we have hosted events like a community barbecue. That is not, you know, again, Who it's a very barbecue? different. That makes a difference. <laughs> Cases. Cases. And I'm just saying. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, okay. Good okay. barbecue is a destination. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I, I do so, want to get. I, do, I don't mean to cut you off. I do want to get to the two designs that we have that we got like three more minutes. So I want to get to the, the two designs that's on the table right now. Okay. Uh, you know what? Go to the next We'll yeah. all move to the bubbles. Yeah. Did you approve of the record, the Casey? What yes. That's in school. That's cool. Okay. I didn't hear that, so I was like. I, I, I sure. didn't want anybody to think that it wasn't important. I mean, we're having a public <laughs> meeting, and the black community that is watching is like, who cooked? Yeah. <laughs> I want to know. You know saying? You don't eat everybody's potato salad. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead. You're eating it for three minutes. <laughs> okay, can, we go to, can we go to the... Uh... <laughs> Now that, yeah, this is important. Yes, this is important. Now that I'm hungry, we will continue. Um, so, after all the engagement with various stakeholders and all of those groups that we've met with, um, we've narrowed down to some driving factors. Um, and it's like that bubble that says reflects community feedback. If you can imagine all of the small bubbles inside of that, so that is impacting all of its additional decision making. Um, and so including meeting square footage requirements, which is a standard. Um, we've, they also asked to not have travel distances that were longer than any other school, because like one of our initial schemes that we showed, um, it was like really long because we were also listening to not having a lot of stairs. And they were like, okay, that's too, too far. Let's not do that. And then simplest phasing possible for least disruption to students and staff. Um, existing students in new classrooms by 2026 with students staying on site during construction. All construction complete by 2028. Having athletic facilities that accommodate track and field practices and a flexible multi-use field for the South Lock practices and potential other sports uses pending layout. Um, and then, as I've mentioned before, um, that the design is to reflect community feedback and input. Can I ask a question about the timing? So the other projects, um, I'm thinking the timelines were more condensed. So this would actually would be two, almost two bonds removed by the time it gets open in fall of 2028. Is this set, set up with a longer timeline? Uh, in, in general, when we first laid this out for the bond measure, we did lay it out on a longer timeline, um, particularly planning and design changes, um, primarily so we get more community input um, during that process. We anticipated we would, we would really need to spend a lot more time listening. Um, the construction itself, because we are uh, keeping students on site, that has an impact on the construction. So this so, is the shortest we can trust. So like, for example, Franklin was 2012 and it opened in the fall of 2017 so that's five years so this with the, the classrooms and keeping them on site um is actually just an extra year versus like the franklin example yeah it, it basically and so then then people. they're on, they're still on site in new classrooms but the whole thing is not done it's like an eight-year project yeah okay uh, Yes. Okay. A couple of questions. One, you said we're keeping them on site. Is that baked in? Is that locked in? That is locked in. That is locked in. We have no rules to pick them. So that helps lock it in. Um, the other piece of that is the critical element for Jefferson is being able to maintain the connections to PCC due to the program that they um, have with PCC and the fact that they go back and forth on a regular basis during the day. So we want them right there that okay, is something so, we are about okay so which that's going to bring up another another thought question for me which I, I that was new well not new but it's a it brings up a new thought okay. one having experienced roosevelt um going through a um similar situation but they were um also 
choosing to, to modernize or to and it had to do um, structural integrity type stuff. Um, so with that, there was also certain limitations around um, construction hours, when the um, contractors could be in the building, when they could be working, what types of things they were going to be able to do. It was going to limit. Um, so there was a lot of limitations when you have students, when you keep students in the mix. So how are we going to, um, how, are we, how are we planning to address that? And um, there was a lot of conversation. I mean, it was a whole bunch of conversation around the idea and the possibility of with the construction happening so close to the school that we will be able to take um, students from Roosevelt and they'd be able to see this work. Very little of that actually materialized. So it was a great in concept. It was great in thought. It was terrible in actualization, actually coming, moving from vision to reality. So we sold something that never actually met. Um, was, and then are we making sure that the Jefferson community is aware of that? We might tell you this, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna do it. It's almost like the um, Seinfeld episode. You know how to take the reservation. You just don't know how to keep the reservation. So, so I'm wondering how do we go into that? The other piece is that it's listed at, um, with Jefferson students having 600 in the classroom. Is that just, going to be a, a number that this is what we're going to have, but we're actually going to build the school for for X amount because they may change. Yes. Lots of questions. Yeah. Oh, I got you. I mean, I got so many of them. I know. I got, so, but I'm limited on time and Gary keeps looking at me. I know. <laughs> so. I'm going to try to answer briefly. Okay. Um, <laughs> so let's start with the easy one. Uh, 600 students right now. The, the school is being built for 1700 Okay. Okay. Um, however, that 600 plays into the construction phasing. And, and so we're going to be continuing to talk about that as well. Uh, the intent right now, the designs that they, the team has come up with allow us to keep students not in the same buildings that are being worked on at the time they're being worked on. So we should they go through the can, options. They, they will be separated from the construction, but to the extent that we need to um, manage construction work hours, those sorts of things, we will absolutely be doing that. Our goal is to minimize the, the disruption. I think we've learned a lot since Roosevelt. Oh, man. As well, we know. Don't, don't, please, right? we're, let's not bring up Roosevelt again. I know I can. We will I not can. talk about the first pancake but. again. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, it's a good thing. We have actually worked uh, very hard on the Lincoln Project to engage students in the construction. Um, for the most part, that has been with, with you know, construction-related CTE programs. Um, it, we have to work with teachers, with educators, to find um, purposes for them to bring students to, to sites. We're very happy to include students in the construction. We want to. In fact, from our perspective, we love to do that. Um, yeah, but, if I may, I mean, I think part yeah. of our equity work with our contractors is requiring these contractors to provide these types of opportunities for students. Yeah, absolutely. And so part of the career learning um, equity component of our EPPC, which is the um, uh, equity and public um, procurement contracting uh, policy. I might have missed a P. Don't even worry about it. Um, it's a uh, bunch of letters. It's a bunch of letters, but part of that is really about um, providing opportunities for students to learn about these different careers. And so, yes, our by um, contract, all of our contractors over a certain amount, which is, of course, all of our OSM contractors, are required to provide these opportunities, a certain number per year, and it's fairly well, um, you know, closely watched, I should say. So we work very hard to do that. We do report out on it um, to our BAC every year as well in terms of the opportunities we provide to students. I think, that, again, that's something that has evolved more since. Yeah, because I was going to ask how long has that been in place? Because if it was in place when we did Roosevelt, then clearly something isn't working. It uh, might, if it wasn't in place, then I'm glad to hear that we did it. But again, it, it, would, it would behoove us to be clear about if it was in place, when we were designing Roosevelt and if the same rules, again, all things being equal, if the same rules were in place and it's required that all of our contractors do this, then what happened? Because something failed miserably 
and we want to ensure that that same failure doesn't happen again to the black community. Because what I will see, what I will see will be that we make it work when we're doing what we're dealing with white students and we we're okay with it failing when we're dealing with black students. And so that's what I'll see because what I heard you say is that it worked well with Lincoln. We all agree that it was piss poor with Roosevelt. And now if we don't do something to make sure that's right with, with Jeff, then the narrative you painted, I'm, and I'm just going to amplify it. I'm just going to amplify the narrative that, so that's why I'm asking, was it in place? And if it wasn't great, let's share that message that this was not in place. And as a result, we learned and we did this, this and this. If it was in place, then let's get ready. Let's get Freddie Mac involved and say, listen, I know that this is going to come up because we should have did this back then. Something didn't happen. And we're going to make sure. I'm just saying, because you're not even going to have to worry about like the community, you know, like discovery. You're going to have to worry about me telling. Okay, so, so that's a, that's something that we need to look into more. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. It's great. Yeah. It wasn't. It was so well. that's something that we'll look into. You can look into a little bit more as far as what the breakdowns were, and then try to make sure that that doesn't happen. That the Jeff. I just don't want to see my black place. community get failed yeah. twice. But no, it wasn't place. Because they all my. I'm, listen, okay. they're all gotcha. our kids. Gotcha. All right, I'm done. I'm Dr. Holland, thank you so much, sir. Uh, I, that's the wife. <laughs> that's the wife. Yeah, yeah I, I got in trouble already for someone calling me that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we appreciate you guys. We got to move on to our next topic. We didn't even. I know, I know, but we got to, we, we leave it at five thirty. But they don't. We have to look at the options in order to be able to yeah. be able to. Do, do, the your packet, right? Did, well, you, did, did packet? you need feedback, or you just want to share them with us? Yeah, no, it's fine. If I, they should, if, if everybody should have looked at it in their packet. We so got another you, topic that we got to get to. I know, but the question I'm asking is. Yeah, mm -hmm. Can you write it down? Send it to me. Okay, I'm we're leaving at five thirty, regardless. So okay. if you want, to, if we, if you guys want to spend all your time on this, I'm done. And we can move. I'm we just done. Do the other topic today. But we have, we only got like. Can I ask a short minutes. question and get a short answer? We have twenty minutes. Okay. No, I don't know. Are we going to just stick with this? Because there's going to be more questions. So if you want to stick with this, we can stick with this. As a group, if as I, we move to the next topic, I'll email the question. Okay. All right. So thank you guys. But well, we gotta move on to the next topic. Okay. All right. The next topic. You're up. Thank you guys so much. We thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. All right. So for the next topic, we don't. We actually do not have a presentation for the next topic. Um, however, I do want to just kind of give you a section about it. Um, I would like to talk about why you're actually seeing the memo in your packets. Um, this is a topic that has been discussed several times previously with board members and the facilities and operations on me. Um, staff was directed by the prior deputy superintendent of business operations to review the Lincoln High School modernization project budget after phase one of the construction was complete and to discuss potential available funds for the project in relation to a proposed project building athletic fields at the Southern Middle School and the School of School Campus. This memo addresses that request. Um, as you will see from the memo, staff have provided a current forecast of potential budget savings from the Lincoln High School modernization project. However, the project is still in construction and only significant funds from this large modernization project prior to budget completion goes against best practice in managing project budget and risk. In addition, cost savings from previous modernization projects, such as the McDaniel High School modernization and the Cowlick Middle School replacement, have consistently been returned to the bond program contingency. The purpose of bond program contingency is to cover unexpected costs related to the bond projects and the administration. If modernization projects have cost overruns, as costs come from the bond program contingency. Cost underruns also return to bond program contingency. This allows the bond to balance cost over and underruns within the program. Staff recommends following current practice to return project cost savings to the bond program contingency when the project is complete. And so, well, just a quick question. Um, how much are we anticipating the savings from Lincoln? 
Uh, what I can tell you is what the forecast is today. What I can't tell you is the forecast will be when the project is complete. Right. So where we're at right now. Right now, it is roughly 7.5 or 7.6. That number changes because we are still in construction. Okay. You guys have any questions? Um, which, which ones do I want to ask? So, and I'm sorry, this is going back to the time machine, but in 2017, the, well, the 2012 bond, it was like, this is the amount of money we have, and we're going to do the, you know, we're going to try and produce the schools with the amount of money we have. And so, for example, at the end, at Franklin, not to speak to, because um, know some people who were on the, the DAG and it was like there was a bunch of value engineering and at one point Jerry Vincent called me and said like there wasn't going to be seats on the visitors grandstands that were going to be posts but there wasn't enough money for the seats and you know if the they wanted a brick exterior or something like the alumni ended up selling like or having to contribute and that was because they were sh short but it wasn't like we're going to come back and give you money is how, what, what's communicated to the school communities um, about the funds? Because it seems, it seems odd, like, hey, we've got extra money in this project, so we can do some add-ons. But if we were short in a project, the community had to pay for it. Um, so just, and I know it's like a new muscle for PPS, because we had a long time with no bonds since 1995, between 1995 and 2012. And so, like, What's our what's our practice that we want to do? Because I would think it's like we we have one pool. And if you have savings, it goes to help all the other facility needs. But and so I'm, I'm curious, is, like, what gets communicated to school communities, or what's the practice we're developing? Well, that is what we have tried to communicate. Is when we come in under budget, those funds go back to the bond program continuously to be used for overruns elsewhere. Um, the the challenge, of course, is that every community. Um, feels like the, it, here's the, the money that was given to them and therefore they should just use it. And I think what we're trying to say is, you know, every project has the possibility of going over or under. And um, we have to balance the, the overs with under funds. Um, if, if we allow everything to just always go over, then we're not going to be able to, to do that. Um, we have, as I mentioned um, in the introduction, we have returned funds from the McDaniel project to, to the program contingency. We've done the same thing with the Kellogg project. For both of those projects, we were fortunate to come in under budget. Um, and the, those funds have come back to the program. That allows us to do other things. Now, ideally, what we're going to do is pull all those funds back um, at the end of the project. Then we can have a larger conversation about what additional can we do with the Right, so we know within the 2017 bond, we already have um, a, a very uh, specific set of health and safety programs that were laid out in the bond measure language, and I think we share that language with you in the memo. It's um, it makes perfect sense to do additional work within those very specific um, descriptions because because we can, right? We don't have to ask if it fits within the, the compensability of the bond. For bigger projects, it would be in our best interest to, A, go back to bond council and ask on specific scopes of work to ensure that they fit within the bond measure, but B, also to do a significant amount of community engagement um, and conversation about what the priorities are for these additional funds, rather than saying, you know, hey, we've got $8 million, it should go here. There are probably potentially other things it could go towards if we are confident we have that money to spend. And so maybe that needs to be a larger conversation about what all the, the potential opportunities are. Think of it similar to um, the conversations that you've had when you were putting together the, the scope of work for the 2020 bond measure. How did you prioritize? What were the things you prioritized? This is a little more constrained because we're constrained within the language of the 2017 bond but it still has opportunities within that. And I think what we're saying is, wait until we get to a point where it makes sense that we can 
we can say, hey, here is the chunk of money and here's how much we have. Now we can decide what's the, the best way to spend that. We well, will have things like roof replacements that we still need, right? We will still have asbestos abatement that needs to happen, things that were within the 2017 <clears throat> program. So we want to be able to have a full conversation. But now is not the time to be getting money from a project that's not complete. So when, when would that time be? I think that's a fair question, and it, it's a little bit hard to say at the moment. Um, I would like us to get through the completion of anything um, at a minimum. So when is right. the estimated time? For so uh, it is supposed to be complete with the final construction at the start of the next school year. Um, there's a little bit of a shakeout period. Uh, I would think McDaniel um, Fields is a good example of things that can shake out that could still be a potential significant cost. Um, so we, I want to say no sooner than fall of 2023, but I'd really rather look at early 2024 to, to have this conversation. And I do think that there are options. Um, there are potentially other funds that could be coming back uh, to 2017 in terms of um, contingency funds that we already have, but maybe don't need for the risks that we currently have there. But it's too early for me to say that those risks are going away. So. I want a little bit of time to see what the risks are and how they play out. And then we might have a potential even a bigger pot of money to have a really valuable conversation. We did very similar with um, Roosevelt Phase 4. That was a conversation with the board. We did a significant amount of community engagement. We talked a lot about priorities. Um, the same thing with uh, the grant opportunity for 2012. So this, it's consistent with, with what we've been doing. I'm going oh no, to leave you up. Do you have any questions about it? Uh, I actually had a few questions. I'm just curious. You said the Kellogg project and um, the Daniels were under budget, is that true? They're not fully closed out yet. They will be okay. under budget when they do. Has there been any talk with like past projects, what will be done with that extra money, just to kind of show as what can be done? It, at the time that we get towards the end, we always look at the items that were value engineered out during early on because there's always stuff that's been value engineered out. We always, it, it's a reality of design. We always design more than, than we can afford, and then we end up carrying it back to what we can afford. Um, at the end of the project, we're always looking at opportunities to add those things back in if they fit within the budget. Um, and and we can actually do that in a way that makes sense given where we are um, having completed construction. So we have done that. Beyond that, we still have savings. So I went back and looked. Oh, go ahead. I just want to um, do we have with the we've done we're completed with Franklin and Roosevelt. Those are completed. They are completed not uh, they're completed, but I will note that we do have funds in the 2020 bond measure for an additional um, planning and design effort for phase five for Roosevelt. So the, there are already funds inside those have not, we have not started that work yet. Was there any, were there any, what do you call them, the leftover money no, from 20, either of those two schools? The leftover funds that we had available in 2012, we did actually put towards phase four of Roosevelt. So that was a board approved additional project. Voted for that. Thank you. I, I wasn't only to say that time, but thank you for what you looking out for no book. What, um, what was that number? Uh, the leftover money. I, I'm trying to calculate how much leftover money is done, you know, because I know we don't want to decide before things are done. And I also know the construction costs have gone up yeah. quite significantly. When you got plywood, they cost $126 a sheet when it used to cost 17. I mean, come on. But, but so what was the number? I can get you the exact number. What I can tell you is that we set aside, I believe, 5 million for phase four. We ended up spending, I believe, closer to seven and a half, but I'll have to get you the exact number. Okay. And that was for Roosevelt? That was for Roosevelt. What about Franklin? Uh, Franklin did not have 
um, any significant additional projects. Yeah, and actually the community paid for some things. Like if you want, because I think about the, the exterior skin we've got of the, um, the sports facility was got changed cause, to a cheaper material. And so the Alumni Association raised money to pay for well, like got paid for a track before anybody else got a track, but I, I didn't want to go down that road. Yeah. Here. So we got, we got, we got nine we minutes. We got a few minutes. So, so have, I just have a question, kind of following <laughs> on Herman's is. So I went back and looked at the voters pamphlet statements that was submitted, and I was on the bond stakeholder advisory group of that. And actually, when the bond was passed, Lincoln was costed at one eighty seven, and then of course we had the whole we were a hundred million dollars over a hundred million dollars short we ended up having to take I think 150 of Benson so we didn't have enough money to do what we actually told the voters we would do and so then Ben Lincoln got rescoped to 180 from 187 to 242 but the whole bond was short so I'm, I'm trying to figure out like and I, I should preface to say I, I support all of our high schools having equitable facilities, um, whether it's outside the school or in the school. Um, but I, I don't see like that we, I mean, I'm trying to think of like how we could go from the conversation of we have a whole audit because what, what happened to the 100 million, 100 plus million, and now we have a surplus. Because to me, it's like we don't really have a surplus for the bond because we actually passed the 2020 bond to like fill the shortfall from 2017. So. I guess I'm looking at the, the the Lincoln that we approved was 187, like, and that we took to the voters, and it actually was 242. So now, if it's what seven million less, so we got it for 235. It's still 30. It's still 30 million dollars, potentially over. So I'm trying to conceptually like rationalize conceptually. like I think about how it all works and the, the message we give to school communities because especially now we have larger contingencies um, this is going to come up more often uh, I, I it's it is definitely challenging to kind of um, go through that uh, conceptually in large part because we, we did backfill the 2017 um, project budgets, and I'm going to say that very loosely, right, um, with 2020 funds. So uh, Benson in particular is split funding between 2017 and 2020. Funding. They talk that, about your school here. I'm listening. <laughs> I mean, the, but despite that, um, even the amount that, that could potentially be left um, would not be enough to complete Benson. So it's right. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I think the other overriding thing, when I just haven't been on the bond stakeholder advisory group, but also looking at the, um, you know, our conversations with with voters in our community, it was almost all driven by health and safety and accessibility, um, and that this bond was really a commitment, and so the language of at least 150, so the theory of, like, there was money left over that it would go into the whatever 500 million 600 million however much our backlog of deferred maintenance is to keep our that make our schools safe and warm and dry um that that would have been i mean i feel like that's kind of what got sold to the to the voters in the community um at the time i think that's exactly the conversation we need. Right. When it's time. All right. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Any put more questions yet? All right. About five, five minutes. Can I ask my question? Should we sure. go back to the slides on Jefferson? Yes. Yeah. Go back to the, we got five minutes. Let's get it. Y'all want to go, wanna get back to it or not? Yes. We're looking for feedback right. today. Um, we are always like, on option one or two, or is that was it just like here's the preview? We're we're always looking for feedback. Right. Yeah, but you guys had it in your core okay. packet, so 
project looked at. I did. And I was just, I guess, yeah. the, did they want to hear from us? Should we, we just email it to you? you or? Sure. Yeah, okay. Sure. Okay, so my feedback is I just want to make sure that we um, have either, I guess my question, question future, and you don't have to answer it now, but like, do both of those options allow for the potential co siting on the extended? property of the south lot to allow a Tubman build? So, that so yeah, I, I do want to say um, both of the options, the south lot does not have building on it, right? So that right there provides a lot more flexibility okay. for us to address it during this plan. Yeah. And uh, there will be trade-offs. Just to be clear, there will be trade-offs. but. It's not like we are going to suddenly have to redesign and push a building somewhere else because there is no building currently designed for that site. So the conversation we had at the last meeting where... So that conversation we'll have about a week. Okay. And then we can kind of go over that, that scenario with the hotel. Okay. Do you want me to try to... Uh, um, Kara, I'll have to get back in. Mm -hmm. Okay, we just want to have this slide back up. Oh, so... Oh. Okay. Beautiful. Two, up two pages. Up two pages. Take one. Okay. Sorry, one more. Thank you. Okay. So <clears throat> this is what we're calling the uh, retain 1909 option, where we are retaining that main building and all new additions uh, would be to the south of it. And you would uh, build all new grandstands and adjacent to the track, track and field. Uh, so taking out the tennis courts? Correct. Um, you know, it's not all exactly designed, but that's yeah. what the diagram shows, correct. Um, so all other buildings besides the original 1909 structure would be removed, um, and the existing track and field would remain functional throughout the school year, and uh, we would work to refurbish it most likely during the summer months. Next slide. Well, this slide breaks down what the phasing would be on this Retain 1909 option. On the left, you see the current school site plan. In phase one, students would remain in the current building for classes. Almost all of the current uh, structures and building associated program would be operational in phase one. The only demolition that would occur in this phase would most likely be the auto shop building to make room for this new addition to the south. Um, that complex would include enough classrooms as of right now uh, for the current enrollment, uh, the performing arts theater and supporting studio spaces, as well as the servery and commons. We would also build a new grandstand area in this phase and have the existing gym remain functional in this phase. For phase two, we move the students into the new classroom, uh, uh, the new buildings that were built in phase one, and then we would demolish the existing gym and all of the remaining program between the existing 1909 building and the new building we just built. Um, and so that would include like the cafeteria, the theater, the old gym, things like that. And then we would abate and remodel the interior of the existing 1909 building to remain and build new programming connecting and remodel it and build new programming connecting the new to the old, uh, which would include most likely like a newer, larger commons, um, connecting circulation spaces, additional admin classrooms, et cetera. Um, and this scheme we envision, oh, and, and crucial to the phase two would also be the creation of the two new gyms on the west side, on uh, the Kirby side. Uh, and in this scheme, we envision the lower levels of the west side of the original building to also have athletic functioning. So we would connect uh, the north and the south fields with a, a sort of an athletics wing on the west side of the campus. Um, next slide. This is what we're calling the new south option, where we're demolishing almost all the existing buildings, but retaining the existing main gym and then adding all new buildings to the south. Um, again, the existing track and field would remain functional throughout the school year and refurbished during the summer months. And we would also work to have a gym functioning um, uh, 
functional as well. Is there an attachment to the to the gym? There is. That's that's why we have we've provided an option here where um, in the replacement we would retain that gym. Um, in the in the retain option because the um, school the existing school has so much square footage in it to additionally keep the main gym as well would almost create an excess of space to renovate so um but you know it's all being examined but yes yeah, so we provided an option where we're keeping the gym for the community to to examine um okay so in phase one again uh this students would remain on in the current building for classes all the program would be functional we would also only need to most likely de demolish the auto shop for this scheme um, to make room for a newer larger slightly larger complex than, than the other option that would include more than enough classrooms for the current enrollment performing arts theater um, Servery in the commons, and we would also again build a new grandstand area and re and renovate the existing gym in this phase. Uh, for phase two, we would move the students into a new complex and then demolish all of the remaining existing buildings except for the, the 64 gym and then build out the rest of the program connecting um, program to this sort of new athletics complex that's now on commercial as opposed to the last scheme which had the athletics on the first side. Um, so that's pretty much the, the run through of the options. Yeah. So with community wise, are they looking at more of the first one versus the second one? Yeah, that's basically what the next slide was going to say. Um, <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, so that slide, um, I think I so yeah in all of our feedback it's overwhelmingly generally that they want to keep the 1909 building um, and then also there's the caveat that this site is in the Piedmont Conservation District and it's considered a contributing resource to, to that district and so we are beholden to landmarks and we actually do have a design review meeting with them on the 14th so we can gain further clarity on the subject However, they are also in support of retaining the 1909 building and they have indicated that they would need to hear overwhelming support from the community to tear the building down in order to support that. Question about the commentary that's on the left side there about um, individuals who want the, um, the full replacement because of the distrust of the district of that it will be the same standards. Um, is it the standards, the ed spec standards, like the classrooms would be too small, or is it like not to code, or what? Which what standard? Because I'm thinking if you, um, I mean, I'm not arguing for the full replacement, but I'm also looking at this the, the trust issue. So say we go with the community. I think it goes to what Kareem was saying earlier that they feel like if they keep the old building that they'll be missing out on, on new, and they don't trust that we would renovate to the quality that we would get in, in a new building. Um, I'm just curious, do you think that like Grant, which if, if that's like a similar thing where you keep the facade, that they would consider that is like, you're so getting what Grant's getting? Um, I don't know, I do what anything you can hear Grant. So I think this comes to the, again, lack of, general understanding or awareness of what renovation versus all new construction means so i've been in conversations with folks where they've said they should give us a new school like they did grant or franklin or roosevelt or mcdaniel when all of those were renovation expansions um, so there's less citing of specific examples and more citing of the fact that structural and systemic racism exists in this country and that black and brown families disproportionately experience our resourcing and less investment in the spaces that they occupy um, compared to wealthier and whiter communities. So, so it's more of just educating them on the benefits of the remodel piece, you know, versus them thinking grant is all new, even though it's still it was the same. So it just sounds like a more education piece. It is sort of share that there. information. Yeah. Yes. So what do you guys need from us as far as direction? 
We don't necessarily need direction. We're oh. listening for input. If you have input, we want yeah. to hear it. Yeah. All okay. of the questions and concerns that you might have now that you know a little bit more detail about the options, that's what we would be looking for. I don't have any questions. I mean, I, I think the engagement piece that you guys have done has been remarkable. Um, you know, a lot of people I'm hearing from, you know, are really appreciate the engagement piece that has happened around Jeff. Um, and so, you know, and that's my main thing is just making sure that the community under, you know, knows and we have more education, of course, um, but their input is taken, you know, and however they want that, you know, that's the input that we take in and we make the decisions based off of that. So I have my own personal opinions of what it should be, but that's not for me to decide. That's for the community to decide. But I have heard um, a great appreciation for what you guys have done as far as around the community engagement. So I'm good. I'll, I'll have more to share. All right. All right. Great, great. Thank you guys so much. And we are adjourned.